like to thank you all for joining us this evening, uh, for joining Ed Prucci and myself, uh, giving us the opportunity to share with you really an extraordinary trip uh, that we took to Germany to, to see Munich and Berlin in particular. And I want to be able to open up the evening to share some of the complicated thoughts that I still continue to struggle with, um, especially in light of uh, all of the things that we saw over the course of our trip. The first thing I want to let you know is debating whether to welcome them the, at the beginning of the evening or at the end of the evening. And I think it just makes sense just to be good hosts and to welcome them at the beginning of the evening. I, wanted to, I want to welcome members of the uh, Germany Consul General Office to Canada that are with us tonight that helped to coordinate our trip. Um, we are very grateful to uh, the Consul General's office here for having been part of this coordination. And specifically, um, he's not here yet, but uh, Peter Fahrenholz, who's the German Consul General, will be joining us shortly. He's running a little bit late, uh, having to come from, from out of town. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to welcome Tanya Matusis and Laura Brodenfeld. We're here from the Consul General's office, and we're very honored that you could be with us. Tanya actually was part of our trip. She was with us in, in Munich. Now that said, you might think, well, are we inhibited now? Can we really speak our mind? And, and I think that the answer is yes, and we have to. We have to have open conversation. Part of the objective that was um, pointed out quite explicitly to us is that the only way for us to move forward from trauma in history is to be able to have open conversation about it and to be able to struggle with it together because as much as we, the Jewish people, struggle with the Holocaust, many segments of German society do the very same. So I want to just share with you why, for me personally, this, uh, this presented some challenges and difficulty. Um, my uh, grandparents were murdered uh, by the Nazis sometime in the middle of the nine, early 1940s. They were, my grandfather, as many of you know, was a rabbi uh, of a small shtibel in Vienna where my mother was born. Uh, she was on the kinder transport. She was transported as a six-year-old child together with her siblings to England where she lasted in 1939, I believe, where she lasted out the rest of the war. But her parents, realizing that this was the only chance to save their children, stayed behind. And they did not make it out. Their, their bodies were found in a communal grave uh, in Yugos, what is formerly Yugoslavia, which is now Bosnia. Uh, they were from the, uh, in the German-run uh, German concentration camp that was there at the time. Their bullet-riddled bodies were found in a communal grave with their hands and feet bound. And this was the only reason we knew this. My mother, I remember distinctly my mother getting the letter sometime in the early 1970s. I was a child. And I remember my mother reading the letter, showing the letter to us as her children. Um, because the Nazis were so meticulous in record keeping, they had a record of every single person that was in, the, in that communal uh, grave. And fortunately, because of the, the Vienna Hefer Kadisha, the Jewish Burial Society, their bodies were transported into a Jewish cemetery some 30 years later. I told my mother before our trip, I called her up and I said, Mom, I'm thinking about going to Germany to uh, be able to see the German community, to see what has been done, to see how the community is growing, and so forth. Um, it was, maybe we should uh, turn off the slide for just a minute. Thanks, as if I see people get a little distracted. Thanks, Ed. Um, so I told, I said, Mom, I'm thinking about going to Germany. And that was sort of a bit of a, of a, of a test. I floated it by her, and it was really up to her to veto the trip. If my mom was okay with the trip, then I was gonna go. She actually was very excited for me to go. She wanted me to see, she wanted me to come back, she wanted me to report. And that's why uh, I decided to go. The purpose of the trip, I believe, was twofold. And I don't want to speak too much before I ask Ed to come up and 
show his amazing photographs. He's a real photographer. I'm just a guy with an iPhone, and Ed is a real photographer. So I just contributed a few photos, and he took most of the, the lion's share of the photographs. Um, it was to see how Germany is perpetuating the memory of the Holocaust. That was the first purpose of the trip. And the second purpose of the trip was to see Jewish communities in Germany today, which are Baruch Hashem flourishing, you'll see in just a minute. Uh, you'll see momentarily some of the photographs. As I mentioned last Shabbos, there's even a Lakewood Cola that just opened up in Berlin. <laughs> Say you never work with animals or children. <laughs> you always get upstaged. Okay, so there's a, as I mentioned, there's even a Lakewood Cola in Berlin today with young men from England and the United States uh, realizing that the German Jewish communities in Germany are predominantly from the former Soviet Union and the Ukraine and they are Jews who need to be serviced, and uh, the, the opportunities for Jewish education and Kiruv outreach are phenomenal. It's very complicated. The dilemma is that Germany of today is so distant, is so distant from Germany of the 1940s as to be almost unrecognizable. The commonalities still exist. The language, I have to uh, confess, is still very great. When you and I were growing up and we would hear German being spoken, whether it was uh, in a black and white uh, World War II movie, or Hogan's Heroes, or one of those other shows, it was the, the language of the enemy. And it is a grating language to hear for a Western, uh, Western Hemisphere voice today as well. But so much has been invested into the political and cultural infrastructure to make sure that another Hitler never rises to power. Germans are extremely conscious of this. And they have invested so much, an inordinate amount of resources to do their best to guarantee that there will never be another Hitler that rises to power. Peter Fahrenholz, the Council General of Germany, thank you for joining us. And it's as if Germany has come to terms with its tremendous power on the one hand. Remember we talked about last week about the power that Esau has. The reason why Yitzchak chose Esau as the son who would be the one to get the blessings is because he saw that he was the Geschichte. He was the one who had the most capability. And Germany inherited that from Esau. That, that tremendous power, that tremendous strength, that tremendous um, cleverness and the ability to get things done. Germany understands that it has that ability. They make great products. They make great cars. They make great things. Um, and it also has come to terms with the fact that it has this streak of xenophobia and anti-Semitism latent within its history. And it is so conscious of it that it actively, the German people actively fight that streak every single day. It's like if you're, you're building a dam to stop a very powerful river from flooding the valley that it had flooded previously before. So you build the dam so carefully and so strongly and you have guards watching that dam to make sure that it never bursts again. That's the kind of Germany that we saw when we, when we took our trip. And you'll see an example of this uh, when we talk to you about the children that we met from the Mendelssohn School and the surprised reaction that we got when we asked them if they had Jewish pride. And the word pride is almost a verboten, it's almost forbidden in the lexicon of the modern German today. Jew or not Jew. You're not supposed to be proud because pride leads to what happened in the world war II. At the same time, there's always been anti-Semitism throughout Europe, indeed throughout the world. And as I was speaking with a couple of people, I asked them, why are you so hard on Germany and you feel that it's not appropriate to go visit Germany? 
but you have no problem visiting Poland and the camps, the concentration camps in Poland, as well as other countries who were such willing accomplices to the Nazis. And the response was, and it does resonate, that as hateful as those other countries were, only Germany had the cunning and the strength to be able to pull it off. If there had been no Germany, Poland could not have done a Holocaust. France could not have done a Holocaust. Austria could not have committed a Holocaust. <coughs> Only the German people had the strength and the cunning, not more hatred than Poland or Austria or France or any of the other countries. Germany had the, the, the skill, the adeptness to be able to pull it off. And I'm still struggling with this. Uh, but I'll be going to Poland a week from tomorrow with the Schul's mission for the first time. This is a, a year of first trips for, for me personally. I'll go to see Poland, we'll visit Auschwitz and uh, Birkenau and some of the other places. And I'll be able to have even uh, more perspective, hopefully, when I come back from that trip. Another debate that I had with a good friend is whether the years 1939 to 1945 were a merely an aberration of something that was a blip of an aberration in German history and when taken in the totality of all of German history vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish people, it's just an aberration. There was what we would call the perfect storm that hit Germany in the early 1930s. Financial depression, disorientation after losing World War I and a sense of trying to regain that national morale charismatic leader promising them a restoration to their original glory and greatness. Uh, was so that's the question. Was this an aberration that was just an instantaneous horror story, this Holocaust? And my contention is that these things don't happen uh, as an aberration. When something like this happens on this kind of scale on a national level, I believe the show was centuries in the making, and that it was the perfect storm that allowed it to happen, but if there had not been that latent set sentiment and that latent culture within Germany and its surrounding countries, it could never have been allowed to happen. But again, that's the reason why Germany has to be commended today for realizing that it can happen again if we're not careful. 13% of the last vote uh, was uh, the, uh, Germany's uh, voting for its next uh, parliament went to uh, an, an, a neo-Nazi or white supremacist party. So it's still there. there is, it's still latent. But fortunately, that beast is being kept at bay. And the vast majority of Germany is, uh, is suppressing it. And I'm going to let it come up in just a moment. The last thing I wanted to mention is there was one more facet of our trip, which was when we went to Munich, we also visited the Olympic Park where the 1972 Munich massacre took place. Thank you for reminding me that everyone should please close their phones. So if you have, especially if you have your phone in your handbag, it'll probably take a few seconds to shut it when it goes off. So if everyone could please turn it off, we'd appreciate it. Um, so the there's now a new memorial that was established in, just in this past September. And um, it's, a, it's a very fitting memorial. I don't have a complaint against the architect. But the memorial left me as angry and depressed as when I visited Dachau. Except I was left with hope because the mess that was created in the massacre of the 1972 Olympics. By then we had a Jewish state. By then we had a Shin Bet. By then we had Israeli intelligence forces. And despite what you see in the movies, they cleaned up the mess. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when Ed gets to that portion of the trip. So uh, without further ado, Ed Prucci, my partner in crime. really know where to go from that other than to say it was uh, really an incredible privilege to be able to go on this trip at all but to go on this trip with the people that I did in particular to get to know 
uh, Rabbi Kropp in a very different way and in a very difficult uh, and challenging time. So what I, what I wanted to do is, I mean, I'm happy to give my own thoughts, and in many respects I echo Rabbi Kropp and said, I think in some respects we, we differ from time to time uh, on how we perceive certain things that we saw. But because I had the opportunity to take so many pictures, um, I think in many ways that's one of the easiest ways to demonstrate to you and to talk about what it is that we saw. And, you know, some of you follow me on Facebook and thought this was perhaps humor, humorous or colorless or off-color or whatever you may think, but it's just intriguing, and I, and I don't blame the Germans. This is the very first thing that we see when we get off the plane uh, in Munich. And, of course, if you're not Jewish, it's completely irrelevant, right? You're a traveler. It's phenomenal, an opportunity to get cleaned up when you get to a, an incredibly modern, sophisticated airport that puts peers into shame, quite frankly, and the first sign you see is that. And every single person on our trip, obviously, there's just a reflexive, wow, they're not thinking about that, but we as Jews can't help but think about that, right? And of the millions of travelers who come through Munich Airport, I suspect a very tiny percentage of them are Jews, uh, but it just shows you how, whether we like it or not, because of our history, because of our psychology, because of our experiences, we see things in a very different way than 99.9% .9 of other people. Uh, and so it was kind of a marker right off the bat and, and put some of us uh, on our heels. But then we began to enjoy ourselves and here we have, well, some of our rabbinical troop and some of our less rabbinical troop uh, in front of the, uh, the Nymphenburg Palace and it gives you some concept of the uh, just the, the majesty of, of German architecture, and you, know, you talk about history, and you know, say this all the time, that history in North America is measured by you know, 150 or 200 years. In Europe, it's measured by 1,000 or 2,000 years. And then we all go to Israel, and it's measured by three to 5,000 years. So we forget just how much history, uh, in fact, there is. So this was a lovely spot to David Mincha. Uh, and there you've got your municipal <laughs> building, and the Glockenspiel, and everything was being set up for Germany really takes its Christmas markets very seriously. We were there, I guess, a month before uh, the, the Christmas holidays, and so every city, every town has stalls being set up and constructed and ready to you know, sell the various, uh, the various things that are carried there. And of course, churches dominate the skyline. But when you look at, uh, in particular, the onion domes of this church, I want you to sort of remember that, put a pin in that, as it were, uh, as you see some of the shuls that ultimately we saw later on. There's very much a, uh, an architectural thread, I think, that runs through uh, a lot of these things. And Rabbi, if you have anything that you want to jump in on at any moment, when you see a photo and you've got a story to tell, uh, please do. Uh, and so this was just our, our introduction, really, to what the city of Munich looks like. And it, it's interesting because many of it reminded me, having traveled through Italy and such, this building in particular, there's a lot of architecture that it, in essence, in Munich is only three or four hundred years old and was actually much older in Italy and was sort of imported from there and brought into these beautiful uh, cobblestone streets and the, uh, and the palaces as we get our, our orientation. And so there's our, our group. Uh, and if you wondered how the group was selected, I mean, ultimately it was thanks to cooperation between the German Foreign Office, the German Consulate here, and the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, who reached out to a, a really interesting cross section of the Jewish community and me. Uh, to come on, on a trip like this. So we had uh, the rabbi from Temple Sinai, uh, the rabbi from Shari Shemayim, the rabbi from Beth Shalom, and of course the rabbi, uh, and then a couple of staff people from, uh, from Sija, and some sort of generic uh, community leaders, if I can put it that way. So after having been Uh, we will have it. So what I've done, I'm not doing things in chronological order, which might be throwing the rabbi off a little bit, but I've tried to group things instead by sort of theme. So I'm going to talk about kosher in Germany, I'm going to talk about locations in Germany, I'm going to talk about shuls, schools, uh, and some specific exhibits. Um, but we, we didn't have a lot of sleep, it was an overnight flight, we were right off as soon as you land at 10 a.m., we were off to the hotel very briefly, uh, and then on to a trip, and so the very next day, we were off to Dachau, which is impossible to prepare for. Some of the other people on our group have been to camps before. I never have. Uh, and Dachau, for those of you who know, I mean, it's, it's interesting because in many respects as a camp, it's really not um, representative, uh, perhaps what people are more familiar with across Eastern Europe. It was not an extermination camp per se. 
it was not targeted at Jews per se, at least not until later on in the war, until perhaps 43, 44. Uh, it was opened much earlier. It, it's it's you know, in central Bavaria there. It's in the middle of Germany and right in the town of Dachau. And as we were driving through Dachau, I know Rabbi Krok had commented, you know, you pass by what's the equivalent of a Home Depot with an advertisement that says, you know, number one home improvement place in Dachau. And again, grading, right? And of course, Dachau has car dealerships and shoeshine boys and grocery stores because it's a city. But Dachau means one thing and one thing only if you're a North American Jew. And to see hammers being sold at Dachau or cauliflower being sold at Dachau or anything being sold at Dachau is, is striking. And so we didn't really know what to expect if we got into the camp, but primarily when it was opened, it was for political prisoners. And in many, and oftentimes what that meant was German political prisoners. So the very people who were that very limited opposition to what the, the National Socialists, the Nazis were doing, were the very first people who ended up uh, in Dachau. And it's, it's really quite an extraordinary place. And for those of you who are, are the literary bent, uh, the pathetic fallacy of the, of the uh, environment mimicking our own mood, a very heavy fog came in, very cold uh, that morning. And it really gave the place uh, the, the sort of um, somber and creepy ambiance that I think it deserves. Um, this photo, I want to make sure that I explain, because it probably leads people to assume, especially because there's such an iconically similar photo of Auschwitz, this presumption that the trains run, of course, directly into the camp. That was not true of Dachau. These, these tracks do run into the camp, uh, although they run from what was then an SS training location, and so uh, they were used really only for supply lines. When people arrived at the camp, and I think this is important, they arrived at the same train station that you arrive at in Dachau today if you were to take a, a trip to Dachau. That train station is some three kilometers from the Dachau concentration camp. And so it asks one of those most difficult questions when you consider what did people living in a town called Dachau, now famous or infamous for what Dachau is, know when prisoners day after day, week after week, month after month, for years, were arriving at the train station and being forced marched three kilometers through their city to this location. So the train tracks are a little bit deceiving because Perhaps one can claim plausible deniability in Auschwitz. I, I don't think you can, but that, that argument's been made. Uh, I don't see how that claim can be made uh, in the city of Dachau. And so this is the entrance to the camp, and the very first thing you see is a memorial to the Americans who, uh, who actually liberated. <coughs> and of course, I didn't expect to see this either, because this too is a very iconic sign that is, in my head, was always very much associated and emblazoned uh, in my mind is Auschwitz, but the Arbeit Mount Frey is there. That, this is actually a recreation. The original gate was stolen for the value of the, uh, of the metal in it, uh, but it's been rebuilt uh, and, of course, placed there. And here was one of many, many, many throughout the day German groups, uh, students arriving, <coughs> not Jewish students, uh, arriving as part of their curricular education. So at, between the ages of 14 and 16, the vast majority of Jewish students, or of non Jewish students, of students in Germany, period, uh, they're all getting Holocaust education, they're all getting German education, and many of them, if they're within range of, of Dachau, which is, I don't know, what about a 45 minute drive from Munich, I would say, maybe an hour, depending on traffic, uh, will use Dachau as, as the location for that just because of its centrality. And so you have a field trip to Dachau. It's, of course, very interesting, disturbing, complex to watch young German students arrive at the camp and see how they react, or perhaps don't react, uh, and what you can expect out of a 14 or a 15 year old seeing something like this, and how they can incorporate it. And Dachau was, uh, you know, post-liberation, there was a, a, an almost immediate call to just tear the whole thing down, make it part of the town, put up houses, and, and leave perhaps a very small memorial. Uh, what has ultimately happened, largely as a result of, of significant organization and pushback by the survivors of Dachau, there's a very large uh, group of Dachau survivors who are very active and involved in how the, uh, the camp is memorialized. So there is one of the, I think there are 20 bunkers in total, one of the bunkers uh, remains standing and you can see that the rest, the outline has been reconstructed so that you get a sense of the size and the space um, of the camp itself. And this is inside one of the bunkers looking down at just an incredibly long haul of cell after cell after cell, which again got me thinking, I mean, I better or worse in my line of work, I'm a criminal lawyer, I've spent a fair bit of time in cells, uh, usually on the good side of a cell, not the bad side. Um, 
this was not particularly bad from self perspective. And then you realize that this is where people were in 34, 35, 39, political prisoners, there were desks, in some cases there was uh, religious iconography that was being brought into prisoners. By 43, 44, where this was just essentially an opportunity to warehouse as many people as possible and to process, that's the, you know, the euphemism for mass murder, uh, these were not one or two people to a cell. These were basically bunkers of just a mass of humanity that was being moved through as quickly as possible. And you can see that as the, the, the trip through Dachau continues. I'll get there. This intrigues me because this is the very edge of the camp here where I'm putting my mouse cursor. So that's the, the outer wall. Now, these buildings were not there. So I don't want to give the impression that somebody during the time that Dachau was in operation lived right next door. But you can see the pressure that the, the city had. There was a feeling that land is land and you want to build there. And so post-war, even with the memorial and even with the camp still uh, constructed as a memorial, somebody owns this home and lives in it. And somebody owns this home and lives in it with their husband and wife and children. Um, I don't know how challenging the real estate listing that would be when you want to sell that, but <laughs> this is just how far approached the city is and how close it is because from these bunkers, you can see those, those homes and vice versa. Uh, one of the things inside the bunker is a really interesting map recreation that basically shows the totality, the entirety of the German, um, the German camp system with incredible detail. So the number of camps, many of which I've never heard of before, just gives you a, a conception that we all have certain names in our heads of, of sort of the top 10 perhaps, the infamy of it, but they were far, far, far more and organized in a way that is uniquely German, as the rabbi said, where they were labeled, this was a work camp, this was an extermination camp, this was a political prisoner camp. And then, of course, we all know the, the notorious uh, classification system for people once they were in the camps. So if you were Jewish, or if you were homosexual, or if you were a political prisoner, or a communist, or a combination of those, you were labeled with uh, those various combinations. <clears throat> and you can see here the outline of the other bunkers, which had, in fact, been destroyed and torn down, but had been reconstructed just to give you a sense of the scale uh, and the size. And again, school groups just constantly working through. And then you have, you know, this appears almost like a, uh, a friendly garden. This is done after the fact because while there were crematoria at Dachau, unlike some of the other camps, they were not directly connected there. So prisoners would not have been taken directly from the camp to the crematoria at Dachau. There was an attempt to not allow the prisoners to know that that even existed. And so you would be taken back out the main uh, doors, which were some way away, and bodies were disposed of there. Now, to sort of convenience and allow the tours to proceed in that way. A bridge has been built that lets you access the crematoria directly from the camp. And you see here the memorial to the survivors and the fallen of Daha that was actually prepared and designed by that same organization, the, the uh, survivors of Daha, which, as I say, comprises from a percentage perspective, a very small number of Jews. It's predominantly other people who, for one reason or another, found their way to Daha. We think of it always from our own perspective, which is understandable, but probably important that we uh, broaden that th thought process and understand that at least in, in respect to Dachau, uh, Jews were a group of prisoners there, but certainly not the group and not even the main group. Uh, and as we approach the crematoria, there are a couple of pictures that were smuggled out that was brought from a Belgian, uh, a Belgian prisoner who was kept there ultimately. And I'm not going to zoom in on it, but we all know what that is a photo of, and it's striking to watch people who probably don't know what that is a photo of, because these are not people from our group approaching it for the first time and seeing what they see there. Do you have something to add? Um, a large percentage of the people that were in Dafa were, as I said, were political dissenters, many of whom were, were, were religious leaders, priests, ministers. And as you'll see in a moment, there are memorials from all of the major religions of the people who were inmates at Dafa. Presbyterians, Catholics, and Jews as well. There's a separate memorial for each one of them, sort of a place where you can go in and meditate. Um, but even within that, uh, the different types of political prisoners, there were there was a hierarchy of how you were uh, imprisoned and how you were treated. The, I think the political dissidents were treated on one level, the, the, the priests and ministers were treated a little bit better, and the Jews were treated, I believe, the worst. So. And 
So as we approached the crematoria at Dachau, uh, I learned on this trip was really um, a prototype for what came to follow. As one of the first camps, uh, there was classically German experimentation in the sense of learning how to do a horrible thing extraordinarily well. Uh, and so while initially there was one small uh, crematoria building uh, with just two furnaces, that quickly outstripped the demand and a very large complex uh, is built next door with multiple uh, ovens and, and characterized by the kind of efficiency one would expect. And, and what you see here is the first prototype for a gas chamber, which again is a bit deceptive because Dachau was not known as a place, it was not an extermination camp, and there were not large numbers uh, of people gassed. When I say not large numbers, I think the estimate was in the tens or twenties, but it was certainly under a hundred. Uh, undoubtedly one is too many, but what happens here is that there's, there's a learning process. One has, to, one has to learn, it strikes me as just unfathomable, you have to learn how to mass murder a people. That's not a natural thing to do. Uh, and it requires you know, the way we would go to school and practice and revise and, and make changes and then revise again and then experiment and then revise again. There was a process by which, in the most premeditated of senses, mass murder was planned, refined, improved upon, and ultimately perfected. And Dachau was ground zero, effectively, of, of how that happened. Um, and yet when you talk about Germany coming to grips with its history, I mean, these are German teenagers walking through crematoria. And I can't fathom, I tried, but I can't fathom what it feels like to be a German school student being brought on a field trip where you know, my kids might be brought to Canada's Wonderland to learn physics, and they're being brought to Dachau to learn this. And you can see the students milling outside the crematoria, and just the, again, the enormity of the space. You know, it's, no matter how loud you are, there's, it's very easy to find a quiet space to it. Uh, this is, as the rabbi said, uh, the various Christian denominations, and of course, uh, the Jewish people also have their own memorial. It's about the starkest, most grim thing you've ever seen constructed. So from an architectural standpoint, uh, it hits you over the head with what, you know, what it wants to be. Uh, and as you step inside, you have the East Core plaque, and it's in fact much darker than this, but I, I, I have to use flash in order to make it visible to you, but it's a very dark spot, really the only light you see, as you can see when you look up, if you get close up, it's not immediately apparent, but you're drawn by that light when you look up, and what you see is the Murat. And then I haven't even paid attention to this photo, as my wife just this evening had pointed out to me that, that, that Never Again is not in Hebrew, but in Yiddish, which I guess is, is perfectly appropriate because that's what people, our people would have been speaking there. And then we had just an incredible opportunity to sit down with a class of 15-year-olds uh, from uh, a school in Germany who were in Dachau, not just for their usual class trip, but this class, had, these students had self-selected to participate in a three-day program. So they were staying in the town of Dachau, and each day were going for various classes and lessons uh, and discussions. Uh, first thing that strikes me is 14-year-olds in Germany speak perfect English. And that's not just this class, that's everybody we met. Uh, it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, and they very quickly like, warmed up to our group. I mean, we asked extraordinarily difficult, profound questions that when I heard some of my, my fellow travelers ask them, I thought, can't ask a 15-year-old that in the second language. And they're never going to be able to answer that. And then we would get very impressive, well thought out treaties as a response. Uh, and it was really, I think many people call this the highlight, if not a highlight, um, of the whole week that we, that we spent there. It was really quite extraordinary. Uh, and they had questions for us. I mean, one of the, the questions that was posed, and I'm sure I will go into more detail, but someone had asked a question that wasn't even directly on point, and a girl responded, I feel no shame, I feel no guilt. Um, and that, you know, the initial reaction is, well, maybe you should. Uh, the longer I was there, I sort of transitioned on a personal level from not looking at each German person who I came across and thinking, what did your grandparents do or your great-grandparents do, uh, to what are you doing today? And that was really uh, an important progression for me. And I'll tell you where I wasn't able to make that transition is with the architecture. And you'll see it in some of the other photos. While I was able to do it for people, there are buildings, particularly in Berlin, buildings that just, to me, I can close my eyes when I'm standing right in front of them and see the swastika hanging from that building because they're just so iconic and they're in every photo. We had, we had an incredible, whoops, 
we had an incredible docent who took us through, uh, through that one. She told us that whenever she speaks to these, uh, these German students, she never uh, creates an association between what happened uh, then and Germany today. And she never uses the word guilt because as soon as you use those kinds of terminologies or types of communication, the students immediately shut down. They're not going to be receptive to even learn about it anymore because it's just too overwhelming for them to even create a, a, a connection in their own minds between who they are and what happened 70 years ago. And so we also were very careful about it. And as Ed said, I, I, I don't remember the, the way that I phrased the question, but it had nothing to do with, with the guilt. I just said, what, what do you, I think it had to do with what do you see in Germany today to ensure that this would never happen again. And I think that um, this young lady responded that I don't feel guilty about it because it has nothing to do with me. You know, that was really her defense mechanism jumping in. Um, and it's, we, we have that principle biblically. Uvanim lo yumtu alavot. The children cannot be put to death because of the crimes of their parents. And uh, it's very important for us to remember that, uh, especially when we look at Germany today. The, 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 these children are very idealistic. They're interested in multiculturalism. They're interested in keeping our planet green. They're interested in just about everything that your children of that age, 15-year-old children, are interested in and in making the world a better place and making everyone love each other. And uh, just, it, was just, it was difficult for us to process, but that was part of the, the complication. And, and part of that discussion, you know, the longer you spend time in Germany, we, uh, a lot of our group contrasted it with well, what's going on in Austria, what's going on in Poland in particular. Uh, and I had a teacher from this group approach me afterwards because I made a comment about that to the group and I guess he didn't want to say it in front of the kids but he came up to me afterwards and said he's originally from Austria, he'd been teaching in Austria, he now teaches at a school in Germany and works uh, actually with Dachau on, on some of these uh, tours and he said I can tell you in Austria we teach them the exact same thing, the curriculum is the same at 14, they're going through the same show on curriculum, they're learning all about it he said the elites, the seniors, those in government in, in Austria do not feel the way those in government in Germany feel. Uh, he was very critical of his own country and says he feels the difference in Germany having moved there now that the, the, uh, the insight, I guess is probably the best word, the insight that German society as a society, obviously it's not every individual, but as a society has is something that is not permeated to uh, some other countries. And we found that again when we met with uh, the, I'm going to call him the Jewish ambassador, but he's not Jewish, more ambassador to the Jews, uh, Felix, which is an interesting title in and of itself when you think about that. Uh, he's not the ambassador to Israel, that title exists as well, but Germany has an ambassadorial level post, which politically is an extraordinarily high post for someone whose job is basically to liaise with Jewish communities around the world, in and out of Germany. Um, and we had the privilege of having lunch with him as well, and he discussed candidly his frustration with some other countries, um, and his frustration with other EU partners, where Germany offers and hopes and says, we will find a memorial here, we will help you educate, we want to work uh, in, with your education system and bring your students you know, to see our teachers, to see our sites, uh, and the answer is we're not interested. Uh, for anyone who's been to Yad Vashem in Israel, you probably recognize this. It's, I'm told it's not the exact same piece. I couldn't find my photo from Yad Vashem, but it's clearly the same artist. Uh, and so a very interesting memorial that I saw. I had a lot of I just wanted to jump in. Ed, I'm just curious. Did the students ask any specific questions of the group? You know, and what kind of things were, were they interested in from, from seeing things from your perspective? Yeah, they did. They absolutely did. I'm trying to recall what the questions were, and maybe the rabbi will remember better. Uh, but I know some of the questions were specific about personal. You know, what, why did you come here? What happened to your family uh, you know, in the war? How is Holocaust education taught in Canada? I remember being asked uh, that question. Um, and they, they were curious about our, our interest and our involvement. They wanted to know how we saw Germany. Uh, so I remember that question specifically. There's an acute 
um, understanding that to people outside of Germany, especially Jews outside of Germany, they might not be viewed as good guys, even though they're 15 year olds who have done nothing. And in fact, if anything, they've self-selected to spend three days in Dachau. Right? If you're worried about anybody <coughs> in German society, it's not the 15 year old who says, I wanna, I wanna focus on, on this as my coursework. Uh, but there's a recognition of that. So there was a bit of a, of a back and forth that way. That picture of the, of the monument, is that in Dachau? Yes, it is. Do you know when that was put up? I don't offhand. Um, I may have it somewhere in my notes. I don't know when that was erected. I was in Dachau in 1990. I did not see that. And it wasn't there, so that's interesting. Um, I'll see if I can get that answer. But uh, what I'm going to do is just continue through and then we'll take questions afterwards. This gentleman I, I found very striking. Uh, as we sat down to our kosher lunches in the Dachau cafeteria, it's not a kosher cafeteria, but they, we had arranged to bring kosher lunches to Dachau. Uh, this gentleman pulled up, his name is Abba Naor, he lives in Israel full time now, although uh, six months of the year in two month blocks, he comes from Israel to Dachau and teaches students uh, there because he is in fact the Dachau survivor, he speaks a fluent German, a fluent Yiddish, a fluent English, and a fluent Hebrew. And uh, he sat down with us and said, when I woke up this morning, this is what he told me, I didn't expect to be having a kosher lunch with a bunch of rabbis. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, I'm not a rabbi. He says, close enough. <laughs> uh, and then as it turned out, when we went through the materials that the, that the Dachau Museum of Memorial provided us, he, he's, he didn't even know this, but he's in the materials, so he happily autographed uh, a copy for me. Uh, but again, it's a demonstration. Here's a guy who, he's 94 years old, 93 years old, I think he was, in, in incredibly good shape. I can only wish I... I last that long and I like him when, when it comes. Uh, but he spends half his life in Dachau. Uh, obviously, he feels it's important. So now I just want to give you an overview of Berlin as we come in. So this is what I thought of Berlin before I got to Berlin. Right? Probably what a lot of people think of Berlin. Uh, this is the main drag right behind, if you're sort of wherever the photographer is taking this, directly behind the photographer is, of course, the Brandenburg Gate. And now this street looks very much the same minus the giant gold eagles and the swastikas. <laughs> but a, a little change like that makes for a very significant difference. This is that same street in 1945. So you have the Brandenburg Gate, which is probably the most iconic thing in Berlin, the main drag here, and of course the city is in absolute, complete ruin. And this is the Brandenburg Gate today. And what you see here, it's a bit distracting, but there was a, a, a temporary art exhibit that was placed by a, a Syrian artist to speak to the conflict now going on in Syria that relates to a specific, uh, a specific series of refugees and migrants who are being attacked in that location. In Germany, of course, there's no doubt that there's a strong connection uh, between Germany's past and Germany's desire to lead in the present when it comes to taking people out of conflict zones and taking people out and taking in <coughs> refugees. And of course, as Jews, we ask this question all, all the time. Uh, we have a very strong personal affinity to refugees. We also have a very strong, uh, let's say, cautious reaction to refugees that come from countries where we know uh, there is inherent, systemic, consistent, and historical and current anti-Semitism. And we question that. We know why Germany is doing it. We struggle with how Germany is going to be able to integrate 1.5 million, for example, when the current population, the Jewish population of Germany, is estimated at 200,000. It was 500,000 pre-war. And here you have the top of the Brandenburg Gate, and here you have the Reichstag building. So this is the, the parliament building uh, of Germany in Berlin. And of course, post-war, it didn't look so great. And here's what it looks like today. And this is one of those many buildings where, as I say, I can divorce, I can divorce Nazi from German. I have trouble divorcing Nazi from this building. Even though this building actually wasn't utilized by the Nazis, it was burned, uh, depending on who you believe, I think most historians will tell you it was actually burned at Hitler's command, but uh, Hitler will tell you, if you were around, it was burned by a communist, and that was the pretext to commence uh, the removal of, of civil liberties and powers uh, focused around the National Socialist Party. What's very fascinating is when the building was rebuilt, uh, much focus comes at this, the, the couple of this glass enclosure that caps off the dome at the top of the building. And it is designed with a whole series, as you'll see in the coming photos, of mirrors and glass that allow you to look down directly into the Bundestag. So that's where parliamentarians are making the laws of Germany. 
And it was an important symbol to Germans when it was rebuilt to say, your government is open to you, and frankly, watch over us. Watch over us all the time. And so inside, it's really quite spectacular. And as you can see, the mirrors, even if you're not looking down, you can see some of the chairs are published back here, and you're able to work your way around and looking down. Again, one of those symbols that, as a Jew, is very difficult to forget, the, the eagle. They've changed the style of the eagle, so it's not exactly the same uh, stylized eagle that the Nazis used. But as Robert Strathler said at one point, he took me, he goes, couldn't they have picked a different bird? <laughs> like, I know they changed it, but why that bird? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but you can stare down. The Bundestag was not in session, but there were some tourists inside, so you can see that you can watch exactly what's going on there. And this, too, I found intriguing. So at the corners of the Reichstag on the roof, um, not surprisingly, it's Germany. There's a big German flag. The very next corner is the EU flag, the European Union flag. And I, this struck me over and over and over again from officials and from students and from civilians. Germans feel very much European. <laughs> not just German, and to some extent they sublimate their Germanness uh, into the EU. And maybe part of that is a defense mechanism to say we're not so much German, we're something bigger. But um, you know, for me personally, politically, I have some challenges with, with the EU, and I can understand to some extent what happened with Brexit, and we've all followed that conversation. But in Germany, I've come to believe the EU is very much a powerful force for good, leaving aside all the various trade uh, benefits that come from that, but what the EU does is it forces a level of commonality um, and sublimates and diminishes and sort of pushes down a level of nationalism, which has gotten Europe into a heck of a lot of trouble in the past. And to see Germany leading an EU, but Germans calling themselves European, is very interesting to me. And yet with all of the new glass and all of the shiny new buildings and all the reconstruction, you can still find anywhere and everywhere buildings like this that clearly show uh, scars from the war, and then the very next building is the beautiful Natural History Museum, hypermodern. Here you have the Pergamon Museum, where uh, Germany back in the day into what was what is now Syria and Turkey constructed a railroad on condition that whatever they found while digging was theirs. Uh, and lo and behold, they found some incredible, incredible stuff. So they have a just a phenomenal uh, Egyptian exhibit. I didn't, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get photos of this, but one of the things in the uh, exhibit there on ancient Egypt was a series of tables on the Jews of ancient Egypt. And one of the papers, I'm sure you'll like this, Rabbi, one of the papers uh, is translated, it says donors list. So ancient Egypt, the Jewish community is keeping a list of who gave how many, I guess it wouldn't have been uh, and who still owed uh, a little bit on their pledges. So uh, maybe Germany's changed, but we sure haven't. And we've been calling them ever since. <laughs> Uh, and this I also found very interesting because what this is it's known as the Gate of Ishtar, and what it is, it's actually the smaller of two gates, uh, amazingly, uh, on the palace, on the way into Nebuchadnezzar's palace. So again, a name that Babylonian king, but to us as Jews, we know that guy. Uh, and here it is, in all its glory in Germany. The throne actually is there as well, but not currently on display because the Pergamon is undergoing an, an incredible renovation. And just to give you some idea of you know, when the king really wants you to know that he's boss, this stretches, I don't know how many meters, 40, 50 meters into the air, and goes 150 meters back. That was your approach into the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. So there was no way to, to step up to see the king and not feel humbled and not feel insignificant and not feel awed uh, by the power. And here, I'm in mean, the Pergamon. The rabbi was able to join us and to be back uh, back here, but I was there with Noah Shack and the two of us were in Kippas, and a kid from New York comes up to us and says, you're Jews, uh, and had all these questions about what Jews were doing in Germany, as if he had never seen a Jew before, and I'm like, you're a New Yorker. Um, it's a very strange conversation that we had uh, under the gates of, of, of Ishtar in the Pergamon Museum. Uh, and this was a map that I wasn't all that familiar with before, but many of you probably are. This gives you the division post-war of Germany to east and west, and of course, Berlin, which was this bizarre island uh, and a city that just was cleaved in half. And there you have the, the ultimate symbol of Soviet propaganda, that as soon as East Berlin went up, they had to hire some Swedes to complete it. <laughs> but there it is, this tower that, that towered over everything else. And to, to this day, I, maybe Peter, you can tell, I don't know what atheist means in German, but I asked the rabbi, I said, what's an atheist shoe? I'll let you finish the joke, Bradley. Because he, he didn't even, he didn't 
pause. I said, Rabbi, what's an atheist Jew? They have no souls. <laughs> So that is Berlin. And then what I have here is a category that I call memorials. Uh, and the reason why I have an entire category dedicated to memorials is because Germany is awfully good at memorials. Everywhere there are memorials. Everywhere. I mean, we would walk past ones and not even stop because it reaches the point where there's a memorial to something anywhere and everywhere. They are not trying to forget, on the contrary. Uh, and here, of course, the rabbi spoke to you about the memorial to the Munich massacre. And, the only chutzpah of this memorial is that it took this long to build. Uh, I don't hold Germany entirely responsible for that. I think the IOC had a big uh, share, takes a lion's share of that lane for trying to ignore what happened there and pretend that sports is in politics and politics is in sports. Um, but it is really an extraordinary memorial that highlights moment by moment on large screens through actual newscasts, both in German and in Hebrew, what was going on at that minute during the crisis. Yeah, it's a very powerful memorial. One of the things that I've been thinking about is that my children have no idea what happened in Munich in 1972. At least I don't think so. And uh, they definitely learned about the Holocaust, but they know very little about what happened in the 72 Olympics. Most of us, I look around the room, as, uh, we have very mature people in this room, <laughs> you know, to be nice. But, but you need to go home and you need to tell your children uh, high school children and older, what happened in 1972 in Munich? And there's a, you know, there's a, a, not a very long Wikipedia entry that they can read. 11 Israeli Olympic athletes were murdered, uh, called, uh, what was it called, Black Saturday? Black September. But Black, Se Black September, in Germany, in a free society, by the PLO, because they were Jews. And, um, the, the, Germany knew when they made this uh, Olympic Park that their one Achilles heel was security, uh, but they felt that, uh, you know, it's Olympics, you know, who's going who's gonna, to uh, do anything wrong at the Olympics? And of course, the whole thing was botched from beginning to end. One Israeli athlete was able to, was, there three Israeli athletes, I believe, were uh, escaped. One of them was interviewed shortly after the, uh, the kidnapping of these athletes took place. There was an attempt to, uh, the, uh, the, the Palestinians uh, uh, demanded a helicopter to take the hostages, and uh, they were stormed by, uh, by guards. There was uh, crossfire. Palestinians killed all of the 11 athletes as a result. Three out of the terrorists got away. Everyone else was killed. And these three terrorists, later on, together with other Palestinians, hijacked the Lufthansa flight shortly thereafter, demanding the release of those three uh, terrorists that were still in, uh, in custody. And, uh, and this is the part that makes you angry. The German government said, okay. And they gave up these, uh, these three um, terrorists. They flew to Libya, and that, and, but, but the ending of the story is Israel took care of the problem. Now, if, you, if you've seen uh, the, the, was it Spielberg who made the movie in Munich, it's been, a bit, been highly criticized because it, it offers a lot of nuance when many times you and I would see black and white, good versus evil. And of course, that's what a movie is supposed to do. That's what good storytelling is supposed to do. But the fact of the matter is, is that, thank God, the difference between uh, living through the Shoah and living through Munich is that we have a tool now, a very powerful tool, it's called the State of Israel. And the world knows that if you mess with us, there are very serious repercussions. And that, I guess, is the sort of the saving grace of this whole Munich uh, massacre. Um, but it's definitely worthwhile, if you're going to be going to Germany, make it a point to see this memorial. I think it's worth knowing that although the, the new memorial is for sure the highlight and gives you the most information, is the most central, which to me is important because it means that Germans on their daily job, and there are plenty going through that park, you can't help but run right by it and hopefully stop. Um, but there are lots of other memorials that developed in and around this 
um, at the time, almost somewhat organically. So you can see the names of all the athletes and coaches uh, who were murdered in this central location. And in the background here, you see what was then the athlete's village and is now housing. Regular people live there. Some of it is student housing, some of it uh, is, is not. It's just anybody can, uh, can rent and reside there. And this was the main Olympic stadium. So I'm facing it, and now when you turn around, you have this uh, this monument that was put up with the names in Hebrew uh, of the athletes and the Olympic logo. Again, not something done by the IOC, so curious. And then when you go into the Olympic Village itself, uh, I'm a little sympathetic to the woman who owns this flat because you could see her you know, cooking her eggs in the morning there. Uh, and I told our guide, I'm like, this is kind of nuts. I mean, here we are taking photos and paying tribute to the stone on, on the Matseva. And sadly, I mean, the guy pointed out and said, not a lot of people come to this monument. So you don't have to worry about the person cooking her eggs in the window right next door. But you really have to know where it is. This was the actual unit that the Israeli athletes were housed in uh, at the time that they were kidnapped. Some were murdered immediately there and others kidnapped uh, away. So there, other than the name of one, there's quite a few. So now we're back in Munich. And my initial reaction to this memorial was very positive. And when I posted it on Facebook, I had a number of people push back at that, which is interesting. This memorial uh, exists underground between the Jewish Community Center and the shul in downtown Munich. And the shul, to the great credit of the mayor of Munich, the decision was made, this was a kind of a bombed out, unredeveloped, at least post-war uh, area of Munich, very, very central. And the decision was made that this will be where we rebuild Munich's Jewish community. And so there is a community center, there is a school, there is the synagogue, which you'll see. And this pathway underground connects the two. And that's where the community made the decision to put up the names of the families who were deported from Munich, the Jewish families who were deported from Munich. And I was very touched and impressed by it, but as I spoke with some other people, questions started to be asked about, well, why is this underground? Why is this only on the Jewish campus? Why is it that the only people who will see this are people who get from the community center to shul and do so probably in the middle of winter? Uh, because otherwise you could do it above ground. So it was interesting, and there's no, I asked, there's no rationale as to why some are darker than others. That was just an artistic decision, so it doesn't mean one thing or another, but the names are there. Uh, and certainly if you walk there, you can pass it by. Now perhaps the simplest, uh, but best known, and uh, in my, I think probably most impressive, just simple memorial is that all over Germany, everywhere but Munich, interestingly, and we're told it's at the request of the Munich Jewish community, which begs some other questions that I think are complex about why the Munich Jewish community, although they, they seem to speak to us differently, I got the sense that they, they do still have very serious concerns respect to safety and they feel much the way we have debates in our own communities about you know, how strident should we be, how open should we be. That debate is much more acute if you're living in Germany and the Munich community has made a decision that other communities like the Berlin community in my view have not. But particularly in Berlin you see these what are called stumbling stones everywhere. Uh, and what the stumbling stones represent is a, a, a very small but very powerful memorial to the person or persons who lived or worked in the building in front of the stone. And they are placed by the German government on public land. So you don't have a choice. If the connection is developed and this is now your flat, you can't say, I don't want a stumbling stone. A stumbling stone will go in, and it goes on the public sidewalk there. And I could zoom in if I went over to the system there, but you could probably see it. What it does is it gives the name of the individual, uh, the year they were deported, where they were deported to, and when known, uh, the year that they passed away. And they do fade into the background as you walk more and more through, through Berlin, but it's difficult to ignore. I mean, there are places where the entire sidewalk is effectively these little pieces of gold. Yeah, they're made out of brass. And we were told that the Jewish community in Munich didn't want it because they felt that this was offensive, that people would be walking on these stones. But I think Ed is onto something when he says that there's something deeper there. That, uh, there we, we did get that sense in speaking to one of the heads of the Jewish community that there's a certain discomfort with overly displaying these types of memorials. And remember, Bavaria is very different from Prussia. In other words, Germany is divided up into different regions. Berlin is in uh, what's known as Prussia, right? And uh, Munich is in Bavaria. Bavaria is much more of the, um, I don't know, I guess sort of the countryside kind of German um, 
feel, feeling, I suppose. And perhaps that's perhaps where there's a more of a concern of <coughs> leading to anti-Semitism. There's a lot more of sort of like the, um, I don't even know the right words to describe it, but I guess I think you get, you, you get, you get the drift. The the what? Or is the Okay. Okay. It's not usually. Okay. The word. No. So here now, right in the center of downtown Berlin, and this itself is a very controversial memorial amongst Germans, uh, is the memorial to uh, European Jewry, to the same Jews of Europe. And what was controversial about it is not that they made a memorial, it's that and we saw some some Germans would, would talk to us about this, how there was a debate at the time when this was being constructed. It was at the time a park. Nobody wants to get rid of a nice park. Uh, and it's right in downtown Berlin. And the question was, what country, and the language that was used was, what country puts up a memorial to its national shame in its direct center? Uh, and that's a fair question. And I think the answer of a country that does do it, um, that, that answer has a great deal of relevance and importance. Now, the memorial itself, we were very conflicted about it. Curious to hear the rabbi's thoughts. There is almost nothing to tell you what this is a memorial of. There is somewhere on your way in a sign that says uh, Memorial to the European uh, Jews of uh, Europe. I didn't even see it when I approached it. I'm, I'm a photographer, so I'm looking for those kinds of things. There is a very moving exhibit that we didn't get a chance to participate in, but I've heard from many other people beneath this, so underground, that personalizes the stories of individual Jewish families. But the memorial itself doesn't say anything. It's very open to interpretation. That's obviously a deliberate artistic uh, choice of the memorial maker, the artist. Um, and it became infamous not that many years ago when, when tourists, Germans, not Germans, uh, were sort of caught jumping from stone to stone, uh, taking selfies, smiling, skateboards, whatever. There are people who move around and try to stop that. So there's a, there is, um, I wouldn't call it security, but there's shushers uh, who are supposed to tell you to kind of behave yourself. But I, you know, and I was very taken aback when I first saw those photos. And there was a blogger who became quite famous because of what he did is he took the photos of the people sort of defacing, or they weren't defacing, but creating the sacrilege at the site and superimposed, rather than the memorial, superimposed photos from the actual Shoah, like mass graves, and put your selfie photo with the background of that mass grave and said, basically, you're dancing on the graves of the people who this memorializes. That was a very powerful image until I got there and realized, I don't even know if people knew what, what they were at. Um, so that struck me. Yeah, this is, one of, this is an example of where I would say they get an A for effort to really devote so much resources and so much space in the middle of Berlin for a Holocaust memorial. But there were two inherent problems with it. One, as Ed said, there's nothing that indicates that what it's memorializing and the designers refused to actually offer any commentary as to what these, uh, what these uh, rectangular cubes are all about. Um, the other thing is, so from, a, from a utilitarian point of view, people run in and out of these things and there's, um, you can use them for anything that you can imagine. So there are drug deals that go down here there's consummations of relationships that go on uh, in the middle of this labyrinth um, and uh, a lot of other, you know, just things that go on because it just wasn't, I don't think the people who designed it really had the foresight to, to make that kind of calculus. What are people going to use this space for? And if you're someone reverential who understands it, then that's one thing. But like Ed said, the vast majority of people have no clue. You may be wondering how that's possible just from this photo, but as, you, as you'll see as we go along, it becomes quite a bit deeper. The ground is always unstable and it's rolling, and so some of the stones are much higher. So once you get into the center of it here, we did find people more or less playing tag and other people just standing in reverence, and other people, I think, just trying to figure out what am I even looking at. Uh, it, it is effective that once you're in the center of it, the downtown traffic fades away, so it's amazing that you don't hear the buses, you don't hear the, the sirens, you don't hear you know, the busy metropolis that Berlin is. Um, but it's, it, it didn't quite connect for me, and I know some people have told me uh, it, actually, it actually bothered them. Now, so you talk about a memorial that was questionable. This one I found extraordinarily powerful and extraordinarily uh, just brilliant in its quick design. 
And this is just in a small parkhead in what was then the Jewish neighborhood of Berlin. I think this is still in the, what was East Berlin. And what it's symbolic of, as the indications around it say, is just the abruptness with which life, Jewish life, could end on a moment's notice in Berlin. The idea that you were sitting at a table and you'd be talking to your family, having a meal, uh, maybe learning some Torah, and there's a knock at the door and you didn't even have time to put the chair back up. Whoever was there was gone. And so your neighbors one day would think Pucci was there, and the next day Pucci was gone. Where did they go? Um, and that was a very powerful memorial in the midst of the park. Now, and in terms of memorials, this to me, I felt was the most powerful one. So this is in what was then East Berlin, on the side of the Alta Synagogue, the old shul. You can see photos of the, the shul as it was. It's now a park. And interestingly, this memorial was built by the East German government. So it's constructed while the city is divided, at a time where East Germany is trying to curry a little bit of favor with the West, um, and a little bit of favor with its former Jewish community, and constructs this memorial because it's right on, the street was, what were the rides? The Joseph Strauss, the Rosenstrasse rides, I think it was. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I may get the, the names wrong, but I think it's Rosenstrasse Street, and what, what was going on there was that a number of, uh, of men, it was all men who had been arrested, some had already been deported, some were awaiting deportation. The wives typically were not, and that was because, as was common, particularly uh, in Germany, the German Jewish community was very, very assimilated. And so it was not unusual to have families, in fact, it might have been the norm to have families where one side was Jewish and the other side was not, particularly the man was Jewish and married a non-Jewish wife. And so at the time, the Nazis were going after the Jews, but not necessarily the people who associated with the Jews. And some men were already deported, some men were awaiting deportation, and the women staged a very, very public protest uh, in the streets on Rosenstrasse Street. So effective, in fact, the Nazis decided here in Berlin, now Berlin was a city the Nazis did not have as good a foothold on as they did in other places. Munich was really the central power for, for the Nazis, and they developed their power outward from there. Berlin was a more, and the rabbi alluded to this, Berlin was a more um, a cosmopolitan and acculturated place and maybe not as easy to, uh, to take over from the Nazis' perspective. And this, this uh, protest was successful. Ultimately, the Nazis reversed it and the men who were awaiting deportation were released, and I'm told that some men who had been deported were actually brought back out. And just imagine having been sent to a Dachau or an Auschwitz, and then waking up one morning and told you're getting back on the train and going back to Berlin. I mean, a pretty stunning thing. So the memorial itself is, is very moving and impressive, but the most incredible thing about it here is you'll see these cracks uh, in the memorial. And I particularly ask you to focus on this one, if you can see what's in the background of that crack there. And it's not immediately apparent because this park is fairly large. And then you walk over to it, and what you're looking at there is a single man sitting on a park bench watching. Watching it, of course, doing nothing. And it's a lesson that we think about so much and that this memorial does such an excellent job at, which is that the women got up there and fought back. They protested, and in this case, they succeeded. It really struck me because when I went to the, uh, to the Masora Tishul Friday night for Kabbalah Shabbat, I met with the rabbi there um, just before Shabbos as well and asked her, you know, how is it that this shul is still standing? Because so many of the shuls were destroyed. And you'll see from the students a spectacular shul. She said, one police officer, when the Nazis came on Kristallnacht to burn down that shul, there was one German police officer who said, no, we'll leave the synagogue alone. And the Nazis moved on to the next synagogue. In some circumstances, that's all it took was one person. But in so many circumstances, we didn't even have one person. It was Rosenstrasse. 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 And what's, inter what's very interesting, again, all of this gets more complicated. Um, the Nazis were not as uh, fierce against German Jews as they were against Eastern European Jews, especially the Jews of Berlin, because they knew that the rest of the citizenry were, were more liberal and cosmopolitan and wouldn't tolerate the kind of, that kind of treatment towards Jews, towards its Jews. And not only that, but so many of uh, the, the, the protests of the Rosenstrasse that resulted in these uh, 17,000 Jewish men to be saved and to be able to go back to their homes was that so many of them were intermarried to non-Jewish spouses. And it was the non-Jewish spouses and their children that fomented a huge mob to create this protest and to get their husbands to be sent home safely. And 
I don't know, I don't have a commentary to that. Just, that's just historical fact. That's what happened. Um, so. And then the next memorial you see here is to the, uh, the women deported to Robinsbrook, where actually my, my grandmother-in-law ultimately was sent. Uh, again, it's outside the Jewish cemetery that the, the Nazis bulldozed. Uh, the cemetery has sort of been reconstituted, but uh, it's not clear to me whether there's actually any, it's not a functional cemetery, and I don't know that there are any remains there, but there are the, the tombstones of uh, Moshe Mendelssohn and his wife, I believe, side by side, there that, that have been uh, recovered and replaced there. I don't know if the bodies uh, are in fact there or not, but in the background, you can see this building is actually the local Jewish day school, which you'll see in the photos uh, shortly, and what we experienced here was quite incredible. This is a building, it's hard to tell, but a building that was bombed out during the war, separated between these two, so this building was never reconstructed. Really and again, just a sign of memorial, memorial, memorial everywhere. The names of the people in the units in which they reside are on plaques on the exterior wall of what would have been their flat at the time. Uh, and now this is one that really struck home to me. So this is Humboldt University. Uh, now it's Humboldt University School of Law. At the time, I think it was the entire school, or at least the main building of the school. And Humboldt University is infamous because right in this square here is where in 1933, students, not Nazis, they may well have been Nazi uh, sympathizers, but not Nazis, students at the school decided to torch and burn books from their own library. And this is extraordinarily striking to me because it sends a shiver down my spine. I, I feel that not in Germany, but in North America, we are frighteningly close to situations like that, where Germany remembers its lessons and we probably should be reminding ourselves here uh, of what happened there. And the art installation that now sits in that same square is done by an Israeli artist. Uh, and you peer down into, every, everywhere else there is a parking garage, but this section's been hived off and you just have bookshelves that are empty. And the quotation around the outside is from Heinrich Hein, the 1700s Jewish poet and philosopher who wrote a society where those that burn books will one day burn people. And that was written hundreds of years before it in fact occurred. And that's what sits now uh, on that site. Very, to me, a very important memorial for us here, maybe not so much for the Germans. So this may surprise people, but I have a section of the slideshow called Kosher in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Flansreif of the Shalom found us kosher pretzels. Great way of Bavarian, Bavarian pretzels, great way to start uh, to start the morning. But there is, there really is kosher food there, and it's not even all shawarma and pizza, so they've got to step up on Toronto. Uh, so, um, and people take great pride in it. I mean, there is some security and some concerns that we talk about, you know, are you nervous about having a kosher restaurant? Israeli flags are out, the, the kosher is not hidden. Weavers, you can pretty much guess who that, who that belongs to. Hebrew on the cut, may as well be at Aroma, you know, in, uh, in your Shalai. It can feel, in many respects, the same. If it wasn't for all the German leaders being spoken around it. So I found that very interesting. And this place in particular, uh, which we went to twice, Humus and Friends, uh, and you'll see, so their tagline is, make Humus not walls. I gave them the benefit of the doubt, presumed that was a reference to the Berlin Wall, not any other wall. But it's become very much a kind of bohemian, uh, exciting space, and they have a sign outside on a sandwich board that advertises on the street level that says uh, Berlin's first kosher bar. And that's just striking to me that I, I don't even think you would see that here in Toronto. I mean, th this was a, this is a bar and a restaurant that its marketing, its marketing ploy is we're kosher, and that can't be for the twenty thousand or so Jews in Berlin and the tiny fraction of those Jews who keep kosher, and certainly wasn't for the nine of us who showed up once. Um, but that's how they, they pitch it, very cauliflower. And now this, I thought, was the world's greatest bit of spin. So we all know kosher wine, you know, well, it's now become reasonably good, but read for yourself how they, they spin the kosher requirements of kosher wine into something that is, reads very much the way you would if you were sort of a hippie bohemian and wanted a cool new thing. They're like, oh, that sounds great. It's pure. It's uh, clean. It's all vegan and biologically pressed. Uh, I didn't know that flash freezing wine did that. But apparently, the bushel is good. 
So I thought that was interesting, and now here we are back in Munich. This is one of the kosher restaurants in Munich, Einstein, and there's Albert giving us his chillant recipe. Uh, and just, you know, you know that the place is kosher because we walk in and the maitre d' has menus in his hand and he comes to us and says, well, we have this wonderful extensive menu. I recommend the orange chicken and couscous. Does anybody need a menu? <laughs> 13 orange chickens and couscous, which is what, what we had. And uh, in Berlin, at another kosher restaurant in, uh, in the Chabad complex there, uh, we were the only people in the house. The waiter came out and said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I've been on shift since five. Nobody's come in. It's been very quiet. It was kind of sad. I said, all right, well, what do you recommend? Uh, one of the specials was the tomato soup. I asked him, how's the tomato soup? He goes, no one's complained. <laughs> I, I mean, that, he did not say that as a joke. It was not a great joke. He genuinely told me nobody complained. I'm looking around, who's there to complain? <laughs> I'll have the tomato soup and the steak. We don't have any steak. I'll have the tomato soup and the burger. We don't have any burger. I turned to Rabbi Korobkin at that moment and said, if you had any concern about the hashkafa of this place, <laughs> that should be wiped out now because this is the most kosher place I've ever eaten. Anyway. So that's kosher in Germany. This was a vegetarian place. Uh, this one was, but in, in uh, Berlin they had a, a meat place. But that place was vegetarian. And then, so this is really quite extraordinary. Also in, in downtown Berlin, they have an, a photographic exhibit called the Topography of Terror. And this too was a controversial thing to construct because the question was, it, it lies on the site of the former headquarters of the Gestapo and documents with incredible <coughs> accuracy and, and frightening photography how it went through the Gestapo and the SS and how, uh, how the plans basically were put together to dominate uh, you know, as they did. And the question was, what do you do with a site that, that's like that? And should we just tear this all down and build something new? Instead, the wall has been left up. It's probably the largest intact piece of, uh, of the Berlin Wall. And it's a famous story of a janitor's family that actually managed to leap across here with his wife and child. And one of the few people who made it across the wall, most of who succeeded, had dug uh, columns or dug uh, uh, tunnels under the wall. He actually went over. Uh, quite famously. So the wall is there, and you walk along and you can see the base, the archaeological base uh, of the Gestapo territory, and then you go into this photographic exhibit. Uh, I don't know how many people have seen this picture before, but very chilling for me, uh, everyone giving the Heil Hitler except for him. Not only is he not giving it, his arms are crossed, and it's very clear from the view on whoever that guy's face is, that some people, some Germans, were prepared in the most extraordinary circumstances, surrounded by the mob, to take a stand and fold their arms and say, I'm not doing it. I'm not participating in this. And then you have exactly the opposite. The women here are uh, auxiliary SS officers stationed in Berlin, who as a reward for good service were given day trips to Auschwitz. So this picture is taken in Auschwitz by SS soldiers celebrating a day off. And it's staggering to see the progression there. And here, my German's not great, but I did write the translation down somewhere. This is in reference to basically the mentally ill, the mentally disabled, and as the Nazis started to sort of cleanse themselves, saying it's costing you 60,000 Deutsche Marks a year to maintain these people, you know, why not just get rid of those individuals? And then here you've got it's really an extraordinary picture, and we all know what's happening. It's not enough just to have deported, not enough just to have murdered. It's the shame and the pleasure that some people incomprehensibly took in shaming people before they murdered them, as if it wasn't bad enough. And I found this, this is a picture that probably everybody has seen. I mean, it's in every Holocaust museum everywhere. But what I thought was interesting of the display here, the topography of terror, is rather than focusing on the child, a lot is written about, uh, the Germans focus on this guy. This guy is, you can throw it down, that's Joseph Bloch. He was tracked down years later, living in Berlin, arrested in 1967, tried and prosecuted for his involvement in war crimes, and executed for those war crimes in 1969. And so it's fascinating to follow that, that history through. And what you have here is, is one of the mass graves being dug up. This is the American army that arrives. And the interesting thing that they give in the photo is the US army went back to the city. So we talked about how close Dachau was, for example, to its concentration camp. And the US army said, 
we're not giving these people a proper burial, you're giving these people a proper burial. And forcibly went back to the civilians of the town beside the camps and brought them in and said, you dig up that grave, we're going to bury these bodies one at a time. Uh, this train, so this is in the train station, it's now known as the Palace of Tears. And trains in Germany, much like that first reaction we got when we got off the plane and saw uh, take a shower, was difficult. Rabbi Kropke and I went to a couple of places, even on our own, on subways and trains, and when you look at the, at the header on the train, this train goes to Wannsee, the Wannsee Conference. This train goes to Nuremberg. This train goes to Dachau. Like, my God. Uh, but this is the Palace of Tears, where during the separation between East Germany and West Germany, so if you were fortunate enough to be on the West German side, you could still make trips to see family that you were separated from or work. You would have to stop at this train station, change money, go through security, visit your family, do your work, and then return. Uh, and very stark, and today it's just, just another train station. So now to show you what the heart of Jewish life looks like there. This is in Munich, so that's that campus in downtown Munich. This is the shul, which I didn't see it immediately, but as soon as I was told it, I couldn't not, not see it, but it's apparently designed to look like a filling box. That was the, that was the design concept behind that. And so quite beautiful. that's Jerusalem stone, of course, on the outside that was imported and brought in specifically for this. And the light, so now we're in the Einstein restaurant. It's all one central plaza. You can see from there, this is the uh, Jewish Museum, and this is the shul, and we're in the location, and then when you go into the shul, this was at night, so you, the, the photos uh, before were during the day, and then we went back in the evening to Devon, and uh, so the lighting isn't quite there, but it's, it's really a spectacular shul, and this entire space is a secured environment, like everything else that is Jewish, you can identify a Jewish spot in Germany immediately, because there is state-provided German police uh, present all the time there. In fact, uh, one evening we were walking by with, um, with our guide, and we had packed by an apartment that had a police in front. I turned to my guide and said, what's Jewish about this place? And uh, she said, no, actually, that's Angela Merkel's private residence. Oh. <laughs> Angela Merkel warrants one police officer. As you'll see later, the Jewish school has four with two cars. Uh, maybe the rabbi wants to fill in on this because Honest, um, I, didn't, I didn't make it for Minion that morning. Right, one, the, the Thursday morning that we were in Berlin, Rabbi Sraf and I wanted to catch Korea Satora, so it was about a um, about a kilometer, about a kilometer and a half away from our hotel was the Hildesheimer uh, Rabbinical School and the shul that's connected to it, uh, which is now a burgeoning, flourishing, from Jewish community. This is the community that now has a, co a Lakewood Kolo that it, they just opened up three weeks ago, and. Uh, there are people learning Torah there full-time. The difference is that in order for them to be funded by the German government, they have to be a rabbinical school. And so it's not just a group of rabbis who are doing Talmudic research. They are being trained to be rabbis who will eventually, hopefully, uh, get a Stella Rabbanus, get a position, a rabbinical position, somewhere in Germany to be able to be the next leaders of the German communities of Germany, which are growing. They are growing, and that's really the, uh, so the German government invests actively in these endeavors. So that's, this was the 630 minion, and then there was a 730 minion after this. But we had to take this to get to the 630 minion. I got, I got the coin on the I was the only coin there. This is a young man from Los Angeles. I know his father. His father's Rabbi Yitzchak Adlerstein, a colleague of mine. And he just came from uh, Lakewood Yeshiva. And uh, he told me what his name was. And I said, is your father Yitzchak Adlerstein? And so I had to take a selfie and send it to him. But, uh, but that's, um, you know, that's what's happening. That's what's happening in Germany, in Berlin. And this was in the uh, Abraham Geiger uh, school in Yeshiva there as well, with a, a school upstairs and, and doing rabbinical smicha uh, in the reform movement. So there really is a lot going on Judaically. How many rabbinical schools are in Canada? Zero. How many rabbinical schools are in Berlin? Three. There's Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. All funded by the German government. 
to be able to create a new generation of rabbis for German Jewry. Yeah. Which, by the way, raises its own intriguing question, because how do they get that funding? So we, we asked a lot of questions about this. And what happens is you can, whether Jewish or not, religiously self-identify, and when you do that, a portion of your taxes, a 9% portion of your taxes, is redirected towards the religious uh, institutions that service your religion, which is very fascinating. A couple of interesting points there. Right now, Islam is not included in that. It, everyone indicated to us that it's inevitable that it will eventually will be. And so how is that going to change the face of Germany? You don't see, I didn't see any mosques in our time in Germany. But there's certainly a lot of Muslims there, and presumably you will start to see that. Um, and I asked a number of people who didn't have a good answer for me. I said, what does it feel like to tick off Jew on a form in Germany to the German government? Because I certainly thought twice about ticking off that form if that were a question that was asked of me. Nobody there seemed to have thought twice about it, but when I asked it, they were a little awkward and uncomfortable about it. So here's that shul that was saved by the lone policeman. Uh, it still stands today. At the time, it was a reform shul. And remember, when we started this whole presentation, the, the green onion dome is very, very similar. That's not a cross on top. It is a Magen Um uh, Just that happens to be the angle that I could get the shot at. doesn't present it quite as clearly. But it's a spectacular building that has been left the way it was in terms of damage in some portions inside. So there's a, a, a kind of very hard, rugged, bombed out portion. Uh, and others that are very functional. And I went there for, for Kabbalah Shabbat, which was a very interesting, bizarre, challenging experience. There were about 180 people there, uh, many of whom clearly from a halakhic perspective, and the rabbi confessed that are not Jewish, but want to go to a Jewish school. And they come every Friday night. And their beautiful, blonde, sound of music, Bach trap kids are there singing Karlach. We have Karlach Shabbat, uh, which was extraordinary. And the uh, Dvar Torah from the female rub there, and her husband, who she's a convert, a conservative convert herself. Her husband is a conservative convert. The head of the school is an orthodox convert. There really was a theme of converts to Judaism taking major leadership roles in ensuring the, the success and the revivancy of German life. And so her Dvar Torah that night she talked about ASA and how people can make mistakes and you may not be part of the group, but because of that you can come back and made a very overt plea towards converting to Judaism. And the next day at Chabad, the rabbi used the exact same pasuk to ultimately say, and don't marry a non-Jewish girl unless you're convert. <laughs> the, um, I'm sure you've heard of this phenomenon that was brought up to us when we went to the Geiger College, the, college, the rabbinical school, um, that there was a whole generation of Germans who had this intense desire to convert to Judaism as a, as a show of sympathy and association with their victims. Um, we didn't see too many of those people because the vast majority of German Jewry today are not originally from Germany. They're originally from, you see, when Germany was divided into East Berlin and West Berlin, uh, if, you were from the, if you were from Russia or from the Ukraine, you were given, as a Jew, you were given free passage to move to East Berlin. And so now, then the wall came down, and now the majority of, of German Jews are either Israeli, or the real, the real majority are from the former Soviet Union. So those, of the, those who convert are not doing it out of uh, that sense of, uh, of sympathy as much uh, today, maybe a generation. And it's such a huge challenge, because when we met with the, the equivalent there of you know, our UJA or our CJA, so we met with, the, with one of their leaders, and she talked about the challenge of a minority welcoming and assimilating the majority, because that's really what it is. There's a minority of German Jewry, 20,000 some odd German Jews, whose job it is now to bring in and, and acculturate and accommodate 180,000 Jews from somewhere else, mostly in the former Soviet Union. And the subway station beside the shul so very public, not, nothing Jewish about it. The subway station behind, beside the shul, the architecture, the art rather, the public art, is about how the shul was, was reconstructed, repaired, and constructed originally. All the photos in that subway station relate to the shul. The <coughs> was built. It's really amazing. We should just go to the school. Sure. Just talk a little bit about that. So there, yeah, there's a bit the Jewish Museum and such, but I'll show you, I'll jump right to the school. 
So the Mendelssohn School reminded me a great deal of when my kids go to school and why my kids would just chat. And it was really extraordinary. I mean, the kids are learning in Hebrew. You've got an incredible uh, array of people, including non-Jewish students, which is interesting. And we spoke to some of those students about why would a non-Jew in Germany choose to go to the, the Jewish school? I'll let the rabbi speak to that. But you've got the obligatory, very high security in front. Uh, and the credit to Moshe Mendelssohn and his approach to Jews being Menches and Menches being Jews. Um, headmaster of the school and this just incredible array of students when you look around you've got I'll let you describe you've got Haredi students you've got this was this was uh, my probably second to the conversation in Dachau with the non-Jewish German kids this was probably uh, almost as val invaluable um, we're sitting here with this is like if you were to sit down with a group of kids from chat you would get some kids who are marginally religious and some kids who are from very, very religious homes. The difference here is that 40% of the Mendelssohn School students are non-Jewish. Uh, the, the boy whose back is directly to us with the gray hoodie is from a Muslim family. And um, when we asked him why his parents sent him here, I think he told us it was because there was some <coughs> bullying going on in the public schools and he, his parents didn't want that. And so they sent him to the Jewish school. He, he chooses to participate in some of the uh, Jewish curriculum. He finds it, he enjoys it. And it's, uh, he, he found it very refreshing. The boy with the yellow shirt immediately to his right is from a Chabad family. And he was in the Chabad school, which is unfortunately on the decline. That particular school, that particular demographic that people are sending their kids somewhere else. And he's very conflicted because he sees all of these kids, some Jewish, some non-Jewish but he still loves learning Torah. So he doesn't get as much Torah education in the school, but he gets a lot better the secular education that she felt was lacking. Not that different from any of the schools that we would encounter in Toronto. Um, the girl to his right, her parents are converts, I think, was, was the, that was the case also. I think her parents were the rabbis. Uh, her mother is the rabbi of the shul that had down. Oh, no, so that's, oh, no, that's the boy. So that's the boy he, over there. His parents are the rabbi. Uh, his the, his the, parents the are the rabbis. She was the one who described herself as a German Jew, which was interesting because that wasn't the most common description when you ask people. Right. Sort of <laughs> something about the right. Her father is a Gentile. Her father's non Jewish, and her mother is Jewish from the former Soviet Union. I think that's why she called herself a German Jew. So it was just a, a, a total mix of different kinds of people. Um, there you see at the end of the table um, uh, was one of our tour guides. His name is uh, his name is Vincent, and he works for the Guta Institute, which was works in coordination uh, with the governmental body that was in charge of our trip. And they really uh, he did a, he together with this lady Anna did a fantastic job <coughs> in just showing us around. Here is the teacher. She herself is a German convert and she teaches the kids high-level Hebrew, and she's married to an Israeli man. She told us a fascinating story that she grew up in Germany with a, a Jewish friend, and they both decided, uh, her parents were divorced, I think, so she was always going over to her Jewish friend's house, so she got used to Shabbos and all of these other things. And she decided when they get older, they're gonna go to Israel. So she decided they were gonna go to Israel, and the last minute, her Jewish friend backed out. So she went to Israel by herself, ended up meeting an Israeli man, converted to Judaism, and is now one of the heads of the Mendelssohn School in Berlin. Her friend who stayed home ended up marrying a non-Jewish German man. And that's the kind of uh, just mixing that's going on uh, today in so many communities, not just, uh, not just in Germany, but these outlying areas where, Jew Jew uh, where Jewish life is struggling to emerge again you know from the soil and continue growing strong you get these kinds of strange stories like that so uh, there's so much more that we could uh, discuss with you but we want to get some of your reactions I just wanted to ask if there was anyone from the consulate that wanted to say anything to our to our sure. group Peter would you like yeah. to say something Yes, uh, dear Rabbi, thank you very much uh, for inviting us. And uh, it was an excellent presentation. I think you really grasped uh, 
so much of uh, of the spirit uh, well, of the places that you visited, of the people that you met. Uh, indeed, you mentioned some of the things maybe that I could also um, um, come back to. Um, for example, the, the, the Holocaust Memorial in, in Berlin. Uh, so I'm not an, at all an expert, expert on, 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 on how it came to be, but I remember the, the discussions going on at that time from, for, for quite a long time, you know, how this monument should, should look like. And uh, it was a very difficult process that gave birth to this uh, monument. And of course, in the end, uh, I think it was uh, very important was the voice of the, the, uh, of the Central Council of, 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 uh, of the Jews in Germany, which of course which, who were always involved in this process. So, of course, as a government, we will never build anything at such, of such importance in Berlin, in Germany, um, without uh, consulting with the representatives of the Jewish community in, in, in Germany. So, um, but indeed, if you think about it, uh, what can you do? How can you portray the Shoah, the Holocaust, in material form if you want to do something beyond just another museum and with photos and so on? It's, it's, uh, I wouldn't know, I, I have no idea. So, um, I guess they abstracted it. Uh, I think they wanted to show, if I remember, they wanted to show how uh, you can get lost. Um, if you enter this labyrinth of these dark stones, how you could lost. I mean, this was one facet of it, I remember. But I'm not an expert. I uh, would have to read up uh, on this. Also, you mentioned that uh, certain words are, have uh, lost their value, uh, are not used, cannot be used in Germany anymore. You, I think you mentioned the word honor. Pride. 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 But it's also honor, pride, <coughs> honor, duty, um, the people, the German word, as folk, and many other words cannot be used anymore, not used anymore because the Nazis used them. So that means we have to find other words. You know, you have a simple word to say the people, as folk, but we don't use it anymore. So you have to say the bevölkerung, the population, other words. So this is, uh, comes from our, our history, and uh, also in politics it means uh, that um, one example, for example, we are, we, we are working now for, for a, a immigration law, and um, interestingly there are some politicians, also among progressive elements, who say, you know, um, if we want to have an immigration law, we, we will need to select people who can come to Germany. Right? So this is selection. So it means you would have to have a system to select who would be allowed to come into Germany and who not, which have certain negative consequences. So they said we cannot do that. So this, I think, uh, for the next period of our parliament, which was just elected next four years, and one of the projects would be to have an immigration law. And uh, some parties are saying, no, let's have the Canadian model. The Canadian model has a point system, exactly, to, to, to uh, attach a value to somebody who wants to immigrate to Germany. So I think the Green Party, for example, would have a problem with that. You know? So um, it's something which um, is, shows that for every German, every German's education, every German who has a, a sense of responsibility History is very present. It's, um, it's a heavy burden. It's always in the back of our minds. And in politics, um, so you said, yes, young people don't talk about guilt, shame. Um, well, guilt, in a way, it's, a, it's an ethical term, but it's also a, a term of criminal law. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I think it's always there, and it plays a role in the political decisions. Um, I'm sure that our Chancellor, Mrs. Merkel, who comes, by the way, well, her father was a priest. A priest, she was born in Hamburg, and her father moved to East Germany in order to give a, medic a religious uh, service to in, in the communist state. 
I'm sure that um, the decision in 2015 to open the German border to let in that time one million refugees into Germany was, in the end, it was, uh, not really, it was not a political decision, it was a decision done from an ethical viewpoint which has to do with our history. Um, so these things are there, they're very complex. Um, when I look, for example, at the, um, the Remembrance Day in, in Ontario, I was there at Queen's Park, and uh, I see that Canadians uh, can be proud, rightly so, they're proud of the history, of the heroes, of the soldiers. In Germany, it would be impossible. It would be impossible to do that. We have Remembrance Day, which we call Volkstrauer Tag, which actually was uh, last Sunday. It would be translated National Day of Mourning. But we mourn the dead of the world wars and the dead of aggression, the victims of aggression, violence, or dictatorship together. And we, uh, it's something which also is, um, we, um, there are many ceremonies going on in Germany, in Parliament, and so on, where we mourn all these victims. So uh, we cannot look back and say that we have the heroes and it's, um, it's a heavy burden, it's something which really uh, weighs down on all of us. Uh, um, yes, indeed, you talked about the AFD also, which is a party on the right wing. Um, this party at the moment, um, it's a legal party, which, which stands on, um, which, is, uh, which follows the rules of our constitution. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a mixture. You have uh, just conservative people in there who voted for this party to protest against the European Union or whatever. And, but you also have some people who probably could be classified as neo-Nazis, even though they do not. They try to, 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 to cover this up because otherwise they could not be. All, they would not be allowed to operate as, as politicians. Um, but of course, this AFD came to prominence exactly because of our decision to let in one and a half million refugees and asylum seekers into Germany within a very short period of time, which, which is a great challenge. Um, but the Chancellor said, um, you're shuffling us, uh, we, we can do it. And, but of course, this had reactions on, on, also on the right fringe. But uh, we, are quite, we are very confident that this is a temporary um, phenomenon which will, which will pass away. So these are just some, some uh, um, I just took up some of the points that you mentioned in your presentation. That I, and, um, so I'm very glad that you, you had a good trip and you came back. I was very much impressed by this presentation. Um, and um, I'm, I'm very um, thankful for your hospitality for us and my two colleagues to be here today <coughs> and all the other events that we, that we took part in and that actually to be honest um, it was um, not um, yesterday but the Saturday before I was invited for the first time to a Jewish service in the synagogue um, which was a very um, it was a very uh, Impressed me very much to be, to be to be there with the Jewish community. It was down Basras. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so it was um, something I think which is very important. Uh, obviously, in Germany, uh, when I was young, uh, we did not have uh, many many synagogues. But I think these encounters are very important. Uh, so I am very grateful that you have us here today, and uh, maybe afterwards. Uh, we can, have, I, I, we can have, we can discuss with some of, of, of you, or if you have questions, of course, I'm always available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is Tanya, and she was with us in the Munich component of the trip. She's part of the Consul General's office. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Uh, all I wanted to add to the Consul General's words is something that I mentioned in the beginning in Munich is that um, we do not take this for granted. We, I can, we cannot imagine what this means for you, but we don't take it for granted that you came to Germany. 
And one question that I was asked um, right at the beginning of the trip is, why do you, what's your goal? Why do you do this? And I'm like, well, I think one goal would be exactly this. Open a conversation, open a discourse, talk to each other, and see where this leads us. Thank you. Anyone want to say something? You can uh, please stand up so we can all hear you. Walking down the street in Berlin, the question, the question is, do you see a lot of multiculturalism? Do you see people of different nationalities, different skin color, different races, and so forth? Um, we saw a lot of Asians. We saw um, uh, quite a significant number of Muslims in the street with, um, with, with head covering. Um, we did see people with darker skin. Um, and so there's a lot of that uh, going on. Did not see a lot of um, uh, uh, Africans, did not see a lot of black people. Um, that could just be a, a product of uh, what goes on in Europe in general. But definitely a lot of diverse culture and, and uh, a lot of Indian restaurants and Italian restaurants and uh, all, all of those kinds of things that you would see in a multicultural city like Toronto. Maybe not as diverse as the, Toronto's one of the most diverse cities in the world. Maybe not as diverse, but. Uh, a lot of beer houses, also. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of good beer. Yes, uh, someone else want to say? Yes, please. Um, I have a few questions and uh, comments. Um, are these conversions that are taking place, a lot of conversions, in other ones, are they, my concern is what is going to happen to the children of these people we have? Mixed families, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, is there some altruism involved in the conversions? And I would like to go back. You, it's very nice that you had um, contact with younger people. My concern is, did you have contact, because there was no mention and no pictures and nothing at all, what, um, if any, contact did you have with the elderly, people of my generation, and if so, if you didn't, why didn't you? And if you didn't, what was there, what kind of reactions did you get? Okay, just to, just to recap the questions, oh, um, are these the conversions that are taking place in Germany uh, from non-Jews to Jews, are they um, done under uh, Orthodox auspices, are they halakha conversions? Many of them are, and many of them are not. As I said, there's three rabbinical schools. So imagine how complicated it's, it's uh, getting for Zehut, <coughs> as we say in Hebrew, the, 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 the determination of who is a Jew. That's for those communities to work out. We've got our own problems working on conversions in our community. Um, trust me. Um, <clears throat> as far as what the ramifications of those conversions are, you know, uh, conversion is a very complicated topic. And many times people convert for various different reasons. It's very, very difficult to know. You have to also realize the Israelis and the uh, people from the former Soviet Union who were Jewish and are coming to Germany, most of them are not really that interested in halacha, in religious observance. They meet a nice German uh, young lady or young man, and they fall in love. They're going to get married. And so then it becomes up to the Jewish communities, whether it's Chabad or the Hildesheimer School or the Geiger College or the Mendelssohn School, uh, to figure out how they deal with those people who are into marriage. It's not unique to Germany. Um, the question of the older generation, we did not interact with an older generation of Germans. I don't know whether that was by design or just perhaps because we all recognize that the future of any society, of any culture, is in its youth. And so to, to us, it was much more pertinent. Um, I, I will tell you this. Um, maybe I don't know. I don't know if I feel. I don't know how I feel about it. 
But there was one way that I felt that I could show my domination of those Germans when I came to Germany. Is that whenever I saw someone looking at me a little bit too long, I stared them down. I'm usually a very polite person. If someone's looking at me, I'll look the other way and I'll keep on walking on. But if there's a guy who's like a middle-aged, my age or older, and he was looking at me for a long time because I'm wearing my kippah, there was a guy I walked onto the plane from, um, from Munich to Berlin, businessman, about my age, he's looking at me as I'm coming down the aisle. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you looking at? Now, of course, he could have just been looking at, maybe I had a piece of food coming out of my nose. I, who knows what it was? But, in, you know, in my mind, I'm going to stare him down. I'm not going to give him that victory. And so I just kept staring back at him and smiling. And my smile got larger until he just, in disgust, looked away because I sort of beat him. And I found myself doing that with innocent people on the street. And I, I guess after all, I started to feel guilty about it. But, you know, you can't but help think, as you said, Elaine, okay, so the kids are innocent and they're idealistic. Where's the older generation? But you're hearing, I mean, you heard from, from Peter, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it is a difficult issue for people of our generation and older. How do we come to terms with it as Germans? It's a struggle. Maybe perhaps some who are not as educated or do not have the sense of, same sense of values, uh, maybe they don't feel conflicted. Maybe they feel that sense of connection to their past that we would recoil from, but that's just the way it is. Fortunately, that generation is not gonna be around much longer. And for whoever remains, the future is going to be with the children. And the I will well, just add very quickly. So you know, walking around Germany with your keep on, yes, you can get some stairs. I, I think there were three, maybe four times where I had people just spontaneously shout out shalom. And one was a guy strumming a John Denver tune, an older guy under the Brandenburg Gate. And it was night, and we were going out for a walk. And he stops playing and busking and says, Jews, shalom, and then continues to try it. <laughs> so, you know, you get all kinds. You get all kinds. Yes. Yeah, I, had, I had an experience about six months ago. I work for a multinational company, and I deal with a friend of mine in Germany. He actually is originally from Ireland, but he moved to Germany. His mother spoke perfect German to Germany. So he's with the translator, he's also a technical guy. And he married a local German girl. And he asked, about six months we were having a conversation, and he asked me a very interesting question. His wife says, says saying to him, and he says, how long do we have to pay the price and have all these memorials all over the place for the Jews? That was the question that I got. I was kind of taken aback at that. That's a, that's a very good point, Elliot, and I just want to comment very briefly on it. Um, the only negative that we got emanating from someone's observation of the youth, there was Rabbi Langnas, who was the, one of the former chief rabbis of Munich, had dinner with us uh, at Einstein restaurant in, in Munich. And we asked him, is there any, uh, like he teaches at the, in one of the universities in Munich. And he did share with us that he does get, one of his struggles is Holocaust education, uh, that there are some students who are becoming disenchanted in the, on the university level. And they're saying, come on, how much longer do we have to bear this burden? How much longer? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's such a long time ago. Can't we just move on? And the, the, the concern is, and I do think that we need to think about it, is now with the influx of this very large Muslim population who do have a, this cultural hostility towards Jews, is that going to make for a toxic combination whenever the memory of the Holocaust is invoked? Are they going to say, well, we want equal time, we've been persecuted, and we've gone through our own genocide, and enough talk about the Holocaust. Let's talk about what happened five years ago instead of talking about what happened 75 <coughs> years ago. Just something to think about. Susan, uh, if you don't mind standing up, if I could just trouble you. It's a difficult question to send out to you your ideas, because Hitler, Himmler, uh, Göring, uh, Heidrich, Eichmann, they're all gone, okay, they're all gone. But evil transcends the death of evil men. We still have evil, and evil transcends Germany. We have evil in the world. So in order to make this horrible catastrophe, that's not only a Jewish catastrophe, the worst ever, 
But it's a human failing. It's a human cataclysm that, that something like this happened in the world. We have to be, we cannot be complacent. And we have to use as a lesson, okay, to fight the evil that transcends, as I said. And the evil today is worse than ever because it's, it's a fire that's raging all over the world. And how do we fight it? How do we and fight it's it? an evil of hatred. You have yes. to be able to identify the real evil. The real evil that caused uh, Nazi Germany in the first place. So in order to make this meaningful, instead of just like it happened, uh, six and a half, six million plus other people that were destroyed, including my family and yours, we have to make this meaningful by fighting the evil that is today. And this is something that I want to leave with everybody because the evil, the battlefield for evil is changed. It's no longer Nazi Germany. Evil, of course, transcends Germany law. The battlefield has become inside of us. The battlefield must be inside of us. Each of us fighting our own evil and each of us fighting our own hatred for one another. When the person is staring at you, why did you not go over to him instead of hatred in your heart? Why didn't you go over to him and say, what are you staring at? Tell me. Let's open up a dialogue. That's You're right. I, I probably should have done that. But, you know, this was my way of getting back. I'm entitled to be human sometimes. Yes, please, please. No, that's indeed a very, very, cr absolutely crucial question, what you're saying. Because uh, we all saw the photo of uh, Never Again, but it happened again. And it's happening every day. You start with human rights violations, which happen everywhere in the world. And genocides happened after 1945. I worked four years in Rwanda. When I, before I came to Canada last year, I was four years in Rwanda. Um, I, even, I was posted there for three years, but I extended to a fourth year. And uh, I really admire the Rwandan people, what they have achieved in the way of uh, justice, reconciliation, and rebuilding their country. Um, I could talk hours about this because I know the country very well. I have many friends there. Um, and Rwanda, well, actually there's a Canadian connection uh, by General Romeo Dallaire, whom I also know very well. And uh, Rwanda and uh, Israel have very good relations. And uh, it was, we had a, we, for the first time ever, uh, three years ago, we had a trilateral organization of the, the International Holocaust Day at the Genocide Memorial in Kigali, which is the capital of Rwanda, with the Israeli ambassador, the Rwandan authorities, and, and us, and we had a big delegation from, from Israel coming over. But I'm a diplomat, I'm not an academic. It is, uh, I see it as somehow my duty, not only to serve my country, but to do everything that I can with my limited competence to to try to do that, what that lady mentioned, you know, so this, this will not happen again. And this is why I think two things. One is that human rights are so important. Because if you want to condense it into one sentence, it means every genocide begins with the violation of human rights of individuals. This is how it starts. You see, and this is why human rights policy is so important. And who stands up in this world nowadays um, diplomatically, the foreign policy for human rights, rule of law, and democracy, they all go together somehow. It is only us, the Western countries, and not even all of those Western countries, you see. It's a country like Canada, which is really one of the shining examples of, of human, foreign policy, human rights policy. We try our best, and some other partners. Nobody else will do that. <coughs> Look at the Chinese or Indians or whatever. Of course, they have good people who will fight for human rights, but the governments usually won't do that. This is the responsibility that we have as countries, but also as individuals. You know, we can uh, engage and commit ourselves to do something. And this is, I think, where, where I see the sort of responsibility that we need to do. This is the crucial question. It's a fight that we have everyone in ourselves, but also in, within our society, so, sorry, just a comment. So, 
just want to know how you go from Rwanda to Canada uh, in one easy step. I just can't, can't imagine the contrast there, but I guess life gets easier. Um, I'm sorry, Frank, yes, go ahead. My question is to the Consul General. Uh, in view of the fact that uh, we've seen the deterioration of Europe uh, caused by mass immigration, we've seen Scandinavia, we see the problems in uh, England, we see them in France. Uh, so my question is, in your opinion, are you going to assimilate the one and a half million refugees? Will they be given citizenships? Because the Turkish foreign workers Sometimes it's with three generations, and they did not get any real human rights or, or citizenship in Germany. And a tertiary question. Some of us were born in Germany, but I guess our bloodline isn't good enough, so we cannot be automatically German citizens, because that was my city, Munich, that I saw there. But when I met with the mayor of Munich, he told me that I don't qualify for citizenship, because after all, my parents were just liberated there. Uh, the, I, I don't think Europe is failing. No, we are in a, in a transition. We, we, um, it's not static. The world is changing, so Europe has to change. I think Europe is a tremendous success story, and of course, uh, in, in real life, you always have problems. It depends how you deal with them. The basic idea of Europe, of the European Union, was how do we stop <coughs> killing each other and killing other people. After 1,000 years of war, people said, no, let's, let's... It was a rare moment of wisdom of politicians where they said, let's stop this, let, let's put this, this blatant nationalism behind us and uh, let's do something at its core, the European project is about peace and security in Europe. And um, you also talked about this Europe, Germans feeling Europeans. It's very important. And uh, um, it's the, it was also to bind Germany into Europe and it, as such to, to prevent uh, German nationalism uh, coming back. I think this also played a role. Um, so, this, um, and we in Germany, we hear even the Economist and other publications saying Germany should lead. We don't like this concept of Germany leading in Europe or even leading globally. We have seen my chancellor there as the most powerful <coughs> person in the world and so on. We don't like this concept. We don't want to lead. We, if at all, we it will be in a group with other countries, with France, with Poland, uh, Sweden, uh, Italy. So this is the concept of living together. We don't want. To. Uh, maybe you would may say we are shirking the responsibility, but looking at our history, it's not something that we would want to lead Europe. This is uh, it feels uh, very bizarre to me to 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 to, uh, to uh, do anything like that. Now the other question was about immigration. We have progress. In, in as far as Euro other Europeans moving to Europe, like in the last few years, we had hundreds of thousands of young Spanish people coming to Europe, to Germany. We don't consider this migration anymore. It's not even re hardly reported in the media. It would be like somebody from Quebec moving to Vancouver, right? We have young Greek people moving to Sweden or Germany and so on. It's not really um, migration anymore. And this is also what the European Union is about, that people can, Europeans can move around freely uh, within Europe. Now, the, the challenge is, of course, what about these refugees, or these people who came to us from 2015 afterwards? Yeah. Um, there are basically three categories of people. One is uh, refugees, according to international law, like Syrians who fled from the civil war in, um, in Syria or other places. Um, there are asylum seekers. Um, these are individuals who are persecuted for whatever reasons in their home countries. And then the third group would maybe could be called economic, economic migrants. And um, 
So all of, for each of these groups, there are those legal rules that we, that we can apply. So, but I think um, that um, these people were welcomed also in Germany, and I think most of them will, will stay. In the end, they will stay in Germany. So, of course, the, it's not as easy as in Canada. If you immigrate to Canada, you get a book. You read this book and you study about Canadian values, right? In Germany, we have this, the discussion about light contour. This is the idea that some people introduce to say, now, these are German values and everybody should learn these German values. But this immediately rings bells with other people. You have German values? What, what are German values? You know, this immediately, these, uh, the ghosts of the past, of our history, come back. So, how can we force people to learn German values? So, um, on the other hand, we understand that everybody who wants to live in a modern, democratic Western society needs to follow certain rules, you see? And uh, this is what, as what I had mentioned before, this is what we stand for. It's Canada, United States, Germany, uh, and so on. Um, but so I, I don't know if you understand a little bit of the dilemma that we have, right? Um, I think that um, we, we um, will be able to, to provide a good life to those people, to provide education and jobs to those people who came to us, um, if they're willing to do that, if they're willing to learn the language, if they're willing to learn skills, and then um, you know, the German economy is doing quite well. In Munich, in Bavaria, we have unemployment of less than 2%. Overall, Germany under 4%. So anybody who speaks German and has a skill can find a job. So that's the first step. As Canadians explained to me, um, immigration is about schools and jobs. This will, you know, if you, you give an immigrant a job, give his kids a good schooling, and everything will be fine. And so, um, this is what we are trying to do, and we are learning from the Canadian example on immigration. Uh, in my consulate, we are writing reports that we are sending straight to the Chancellor's office so that we uh, can um, use this best, uh, best practice. 